knew a man who grew up in the 40s, and he said, my dad used to have a saying, there's three things in life that you can count on, death, taxes, and the New York Yankees. That was back when uh, they were winning just about every World Series, and you can't really count on the New York Yankees anymore, but you can still count on death and taxes. It's always been that way. Jesus said that much 2,000 years ago. This morning, I want you to find with me in your Bibles, Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12 and verse 13. We're going to look at three different questions, and I know that you're probably going to be thinking this morning as we work our way through this text that what on earth do these three topics have to do with one another? You're just preaching three different sermons, but what I'm looking at this morning, these Three questions are taken as a unit. We can see that from the very first question to the very last phrase where it says that no one dared to ask him any more questions. And it shows that Jesus has complete authority to answer every question that you have in your life. There's not one question that we can't bring to him. He has the ultimate authority to answer all of life's most difficult questions, questions about life and questions of death, but ultimately that Jesus Christ himself is the answer to all of life's questions. Now, look with me here. Mark chapter 12, verse 13. The Bible says, then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, teacher, we know that you're true and that you care about no one for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay Or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Jesus first addresses the question of paying the authorities and that's exactly what he tells us that we must pay the authorities we read here that the pharisees and the herodians come together now this is an unlikely pair they are usually enemies they had very different political agendas but they come together for a bipartisan attack on christ and they come to ask him this question to set a trap if you will for jesus And the trap is clearly laid like a steel trap that an animal might step into. And then they cover it up so that he won't see it. They try to cover it up with the flowers of flattery. Oh, we know that you have no regard for the opinions of people. That you don't look at the weather vane to see which way the wind is blowing before you answer a difficult question. That you just speak the truth of God from God. And so after trying to set him up, to get him to give an unfiltered response, they ask him this question, which is a very, very controversial question. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or should we not? Now, to give you a little bit of background on this, this taxation of Judea had begun in 86. And under Herod Archelaus, the Romans had begun to tax the Judean province and it had caused a revolt when they instituted the tax. And it would also, 33 years after Jesus says these words, spark another revolt against Rome. So this is a very controversial question. And it really, they're trying to set him up to give one of two answers. Either you pay taxes or you shouldn't pay taxes. And either way, it's going to be bad for Jesus. Because if he says that you should pay taxes, then all of the Jewish zealous followers who are very nationalistic for their independence are going to get mad at him if he says that uh, you should not pay them then the Romans are going to come and charge him with sedition so either way it's a bad scenario it'd be kind of like if uh, you came up this morning and said pastor David I want you to get up and speak this morning about the results of the 2020 election you understand that there's nothing that I could say that wouldn't get me in trouble 
I, I mean, if I said that Joe Biden beat uh, Trump, then, then uh, some of you would be furious. If I said that there was election fraud, some people would get furious. So, so regardless of however you answer that question, you're going to make some people very angry. And that's exactly what they're trying to do to Jesus. The, sort, so the consequences are more severe. And on top of that, there's also a theological implication besides just a patriotism issue. Because on the coin, you know, Jesus, he doesn't just respond to an answer to the question he asks the question he first of all he understands it's a trap he understands what they're doing and he says bring me a denarius now he knew whose picture was on that coin just as much as I know whose image is on a quarter or whose picture is on a 20 dollar bill he didn't need to look at it to figure that out but he's really, I think, doing several things here. He's giving the opportunity to kind of for the anticipation of his answer. But also, guess what? These guys that are saying it's so bad to carry around these Roman coins and it's so bad to pay taxes, they got one in their pocket. And so they have more complicity in this taxation system than they would like to say. But they bring it there, and when they pull out the coin, you know that Tiberius Caesar, his image, his inscription is on the coin. And that inscription said, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of, uh, August, uh, son of the divine Augustus. Now, on the opposite side of the coin, it had a picture of Tiberius' mother, and it said the words, Pontifex Maximus, or high priest. And so there's clear calling Augustus divine, referring to the high priest as the, the Roman uh, family. It was very clearly a theological issue as well as a social and political issue. But after looking at that particular coin, Jesus asked a brilliant question. And again, he already knows the answer. Whose image and inscription is this? And, and the answer is it's, it's Caesar's. And he says, in essence, if I can paraphrase exactly what he's saying, then give to Caesar the things that have the inscription and the image of Caesar upon them and give to God the things that have the image of God upon them. God is telling, Jesus is telling us that we must give God our lives. Now, as I was looking and studying this passage, I'd planned to preach all of this as three questions, this entire section that we're going to be looking at this morning. And after the events of Wednesday, I, I considered preaching this particular passage alone. Isn't it amazing the providence of God, just how he always, his timing is perfect as you work through a book of the Bible. It's always relevant, isn't it? And, uh, but I, I thought about just preaching on this particular issue, but because of, there's so many things I'd, I'd like to say about this that I, I felt like I don't have time for this morning. I want to encourage you, come on Wednesday night. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you two for one. Uh, we're going to look at just the issue of God and government and our response to government. Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, hope you can be here. But uh, let, let me just say this kind of very, very quickly. I won't go into all the detail. But first, Jesus acknowledges that there is a separation between God and government. Now, government derives its authority ultimately from God, but there is a difference between God and government. Therefore, he says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and Caesar's and the things that are God's to God. But, but the other thing we have to acknowledge that Jesus is saying here is that we are called as Christians to be good citizens. We are called as Christians to be good citizens, to pay your taxes to the infernal revenue service. I mean, excuse me, the internal revenue service. He, he says that well, we need to exercise the responsibilities of citizenship uh, and that we need to obey the laws of our land. It's very clear that well, no matter what people try to turn Jesus into, that he's not a political anarchist. Uh, that he says that we need to get along. And this is not only what he says here in Mark, and it's repeated in other, play, other Gospels, but he says it in Romans chapter 13. He instructs us to pray for leaders in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, and Peter, he tells us all these same principles again and again. We're going to look at those in more detail and how they translate to American society later on. But what Jesus says first and foremost, and this is what I don't want you to miss, he's not speaking so much here about government, but about God. He's talking more about God than he is the government. And so when he asks whose image and whose inscription is this, and the answer is it's, it's Caesar's, he says, well, give to Caesar the things that have Caesar's image upon them and give to God the things that have God's image upon them. 
In other words, that word there, the Greek word icon, image, is the same word that's used in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 when it says that man is made, man men and women, uh, male and female, are created in the image and the likeness of God. And therefore, we've been made in the image of God, and therefore, we belong to God. I heard someone say this week something I thought, well, that's a, that's a great way to say it. He said, man is not made, excuse me, God is not made in the imagination of men, but men are made in the image of God. You understand what he's saying there? That, we, that God is not the creation of human beings. That we have not created a God to our own likeness but rather that we are made in his image. And that means that God has authority over your life. What you do, your morality, your decisions, the direction of your life has to be determined by God, not by yourself. And and there are responsibilities we have politically. Uh, We have responsibilities as citizens of the United States and to the government under which we're under its authority. But Jesus is making very clear that while we are to give our taxes to the government, we are to give the totality of our lives to God. And we owe him all things. Government, we owe some things, but we don't owe him every, owe it everything, but we owe God everything that we are. Now, Jesus cares about your citizenship in an earthly country, But more importantly, he cares about your citizenship in an eternal city. And God wants you to be a good citizen, both here below as well as the citizen there above. And and the one thing I want to say, without going too much into detail on this, is saying this, is that we must identify that Jesus, while he calls us to be good citizens of our countries, that we have to also separate our allegiance to government from our allegiance to God to some extent. I, I believe one of the great dangers that faces many people is they try to take their political, their politics and, and the policies of a particular party and they wrap them up so closely in their Christianity that they can't see the difference between the two. And, and you have to be able to distinguish yourself and say, first and foremost, I am a Christian. Jesus said it like this in John 18, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were so, my servants would fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Folks, where is your citizenship? Is your citizenship in heaven? I hope it is. And this morning, while you are to pay the authorities, you're not to give them everything. You're to give God everything. And this morning, I hope that in April you're going to render your taxes I've got a, here actually in just a few days, and uh, the 15th of January, I, I have to file them for tax purposes. I'm self-employed. Maybe some of you are as well. And I've got to pay taxes, fourth quarter 2020 taxes on January the 15th. I've got to render to Caesar this week. The more important question for you is this week, are you rendering your life to God? Are you giving your life completely and fully to the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, he talks about paying the authorities, but also he speaks about preparing for the afterlife. Notice there in verse 18. Then some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife, raise up offspring, and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her, and he died, and nor did he leave any offspring. And the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. And Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken? Because you do not know the Scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. But they are like the angels in heaven. But concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. Now, 
This is the only time in Mark's gospel that the word Sadducees is used. We usually don't find Jesus interacting with the Sadducees because they were pretty much local to Jerusalem. And Jesus has, Mark has spent the majority of his time focusing on Jesus' Galilean ministry. Now they're going to be present again at the trial of Jesus because they, many of them made up the uh, group called the Sanhedrin that you'll read about at Jesus' trial. But to give you a little bit of the understanding of what was taking place in Israel at that time, first century politics, is there were two main groups, kind of like we have Democrats and Republicans. They had they were political and religious parties, but they had Pharisees, which were the right-wing conservative group, and they had the Sadducees, which were the liberals, if you will. And the Sadducees have been standing in the temple. They're watching Jesus. I mean, there has to be a huge crowd around Jesus. As he's, you know, he's in the temple. Everybody's there. They all want to listen to this famous prophet from Galilee. And the Pharisees ask their question, and they get stumped. And the Sadducees are standing there, and they want to kind of show off, right? So if this guy is, we're, we're glad he stumped the Pharisees, but now it's our turn, and we're going to ask a question to show our intellectual superiority over the Pharisees by finally being able to stump this great teacher. So they ask this question, and uh, go ahead and get along, go ahead and tell you this, and I'll mention this one more time later on, but there are three things that the Sadducees did not believe in. This is very important here. They did not believe in the afterlife or the resurrection. They didn't believe anything happened to a person when you died. So they don't believe in the afterlife or resurrection. They do not believe in angels. And they only accept as scripture the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The, by, the five books written by Moses. Anything after that, the prophets, the rest of the Old Testament, they reject. Now the Pharisees accept all of those things. But the Sadducees do not. So they know that and they begin to ask a question based upon... Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 and 6, and a custom called Leverite marriage. This is very strange. I, I know this. It's a very strange passage. But they point out that according to the law of Moses, that, and the custom of Leverite marriage, that when a man died, that his brother, or if he didn't have a brother, the next of kin in his family, would marry his widow. And, if, if, of course, if the man didn't have children. And try to raise up a son. Now, when the son was born... The firstborn son would be registered as the child of the dead man. Any children after that would be registered as his own children. But the firstborn son would be registered as the child of the dead man. Now, again, this was practiced prior to the giving of the law of Moses. In Genesis 38, written before Exodus 20, uh, or at least, excuse me, it, historically it occurred before Exodus 20. And in that passage... Uh, there is already this custom. It was common not just in Israel but all throughout the ancient Near East. And the reason why the intention of the Leverite marriage was in order to ensure property. Uh, so that a property would stay in a family given to a particular name. And that was the entire reason for this. Now it seems that probably after the Babylon captivity that there is no longer as much emphasis on this, and it may not have even been practiced anymore in the time of Jesus. But nonetheless, the Sadducees use this as kind of a concocted test case on Jesus. Now, just suppose this happened, they say. Woman, same woman is married to seven brothers. None of them have any children with her. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Now, Jesus, they think, is going to take one of two courses. They think that on the one that he's going to have to make a very strange argument that either she will be the wife of the first husband or the last husband. Or... The more, the easier assumption is that there is no resurrection. Uh, they haven't even thought about the possibility of there being no marriage in heaven. But they begin with this. They think that they've set Jesus up and they wait for his response. Now Jesus humiliates them. He begins in verse 24 by saying, you are greatly Mistaken. Now, that word mistaken here, and the Greek word here is planeo. It's the Greek verb uh, to, to wonder. Now, that word comes from the Greek word planan, which we get our English word planet. And for the ancients, when they looked up at the night sky, they realized that the stars always kind of seemed to be in a fixed pattern. But in reference to the stars, the planets would wonder. Uh, they seem to be off track. And so, in other words, Jesus is looking at them and he's saying, hey, guess what, guys? You're way off track here. You're completely out of alignment. And the reason that you're out of alignment is, first of all, you have zero understanding of the Scriptures. 
Now, realize that Jesus is saying this to the most astute Bible scholars in Israel. I mean, this is the cream of the crop. This is the Ivy League. This is like going to Wall Street and going up to a Wall Street stockbroker and saying, guess what, sir? You have zero understanding of finance. He says, you don't understand the scriptures. And you don't understand the power of God. And it's very clear they don't understand the scriptures. And that's why they don't understand the power of God. Because if they had understood the power of the God revealed in the Hebrew Old Testament, the God who brought something out of nothing, the God who said to the Red Sea, be parted, the God who gave manna from heaven, the God who gave miracle after miracle, They'd understand that the God is capable of raising the dead to life. In fact, that the Bible would almost indicate that God would have to raise the dead to life when we understand the Old Testament. And Jesus begins to show them how they don't understand the power of God. But then he continues and he begins to show them that not only do, do they not understand the power of God and do they not understand the scriptures, but they've also mistaken about one thing, that they assume that the life to come is going to be like the present life, and particularly on the issue of marriage. Because they've made their entire case with the assumption that people are going to be married in heaven. And he says that's not true. Now, this may confuse people. It bothers some people. It doesn't bother others. I guess it depends on how good your marriage is. I had an old man tell me one time, he said, son, I always knew that. He said, I've been married to my wife for 60 years. And if I had to be married to her in heaven, that'd make it hell. (laughs) Now, I don't want you to think that Jesus is putting down marriage when he makes this remark. Uh, you know, the Bible says that in my father's house would be many mansions or many rooms, been on your translation there. And, and uh, I, I just went ahead, I've, I went ahead and asked the Lord, I put in a request that Laura and I are going to get to be roommates for all eternity. But, but as we think about what Jesus is say, saying here, it's very clear that, uh, that, that he's saying that, that, you know, it's not that we're not going to know your spouse. You're going to know your spouse in heaven. If both of you are believers. You'll both know one another, and, uh, and you'll be best friends forever. Maybe that's the best I can say. But what Jesus is trying to say here is that the limitations and weaknesses of life here in this creation will not be present in the world to come to make the marriage necessary. Now, let me just, I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but let me say a couple of things about this. There are some reasons why in this creation, marriage is, generally speaking, the plan for most people. Because here in this world, there's loneliness. And when you get married, you know, hopefully, um, that will take away some of the loneliness of life here. But in heaven, we're going to see God's presence fully manifested day and night. We're going to be with all the other believers of all the other ages. There's not going to be any loneliness in heaven. Uh, There's also a need here in this world for help and having a helpmate. And as long as we're here, you find that just practically speaking, I mean, you can't be in two places at once. Uh, You've only got two arms. I see here and someone holding a baby, you know, and, and after a while, but uh, uh, Maggie and Ethan know when they have twins, you, you only got uh, two arms. You got two babies. Sometimes you need to help me. There's all kinds of situations, and uh, we, we can't be in two places at once, but, you know, and we read over there when Jesus was raised from the dead, it seemed like he could be about everywhere at once. There's, there won't be those restrictions anymore that we need to help me. And then there's the issue of aging. Uh, we get married and uh, we say in sickness and in health for richer for poor. And you think about that aging process. As we get older, we need somebody to be there by our side to take care of us in life's most vulnerable moments. But there's not going to be any aging. There's not going to be any sickness. There's not going to be any death. And then there's the issue of procreation. You know, obviously uh, God has called us to fill the earth. And of course, the entire creation there will be filled with those who've named the name of Christ. But Even when we think about raising up a family, you're thinking about perpetrating a family name because after we're here and gone, well, there's not going to be any more after we're dead and gone because in heaven we're going to be alive forever. So I believe Jesus is trying to say, you've completely misunderstood what the world to come is going to be like. And it's going to be a completely different reality. Now, what Jesus does... It's kind of funny, by the way. He says, we're not going to be married, but we're going to be like the angels. He's not saying you're going to become angels. Some people think that. When you die, you don't become an angel. But he says you're going to be like the angels. 
which I think that Jesus added a little bit here because he has a sense of humor and he knows not only they don't believe in the resurrection, they don't believe in angels. <laughs> so he says, you're going to be up to angels that you don't believe in. And, and uh, we're going to be like that because we're going to be with God. We're going to be with God in heaven. Now, when he begins to make an argument for the resurrection and for the life to come, he could have used a number of Old Testament passages that very, very clearly lay out the doctrine of physical resurrection. You talk about Isaiah 26, Ezekiel 37, Daniel chapter 12, or Psalm 73. But he doesn't go to any of those texts because he knows that they don't accept those as Scripture. So he goes to the ones they do accept as Scripture. He goes to the book of Exodus in chapter 3 and verse 6, and he begins to say how when God appeared to Moses, he says, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac. Isaac of Jacob and I'm the God of Isaac and in other words what Jesus is saying there is that by the implied present tense and by the repetition of the phrase I am the God of with each name of each patriarch that God has a relationship with every one of those men and that that relationship is not ended by their death but continues in the present remember this one man said this that death in or changes our relationship to the world and to other people but it does not change your relationship to God Death does not change your relationship to God. Instead, death is something that, continu- that uh, even in our death, uh, life is continued spiritually for those who trust God. And Hebrews chapter 11, it makes it very clear that God's promises to the patriarchs were not just for their lifetime, but ha- were even implied that they hoped for and believed that God would do something for them to give them an eternal city. And God continues his promises. If God made the promises he made to the patriarchs, and they died without ever seeing those promises, then God lied. But God did not lie. God says it is implied and that there is life after death, and life after death demands the resurrection from the dead. He makes it very clear that there is life to come, that he will raise the dead in Christ. Many people don't understand the doctrine of the resurrection. There are some of you here, maybe this morning, you're a Christian. And every time I do a funeral, people look at me like I'm crazy when I stand at the head of the casket and I place my hand on the casket and I say, read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. I say that, you know, we're burying this body here. We know that this person's spirit is in heaven with Christ and that they're already alive and with Christ in heaven. But we say that the Lord's coming again. And when the Lord comes again, that spirit which is in heaven is going to come and it's going to be rejoined with the body, which is not going to be the body that was sown there in the ground. It'll be a correspondence, but it's going to be a transformed, renewed, immortal, eternal body, glorious body. And it's going to rise up from the ground and God will meet the Lord in the air when he comes. See, just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, we too will rise from the dead. If we forget that, we've forgotten the central Christian doctrine of a hope of eternal life. See, it's a good thing to realize that when you die, the best is yet to come. But you understand that's not it. Our hope is not in life after death. My hope is not in life after death. My hope is in the life that's after life after death. It's not just life after death. It's the life that comes after death. Or life after life after death. And I want to, the main thing, here's the thing. I want to back up a little moment here because we can talk about all the what's going to happen when we die and Jesus focuses on some of that but I want you to miss the main point of what he's saying he's saying this that no matter whether you're talking about life or death Jesus has the authority to answer all the questions about it he has the authority to answer all the questions about it and instead of debating debating the trivial about death and what happens next make sure you have a ticket Make sure that you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ because death is certain, just like taxes. And are you ready for it? One of these days, they're going to take your body and they're either going to roll you into the mortuary to to be embalmed, maybe roll you to be cremated somewhere. You're going to die. You can try to deny it, but you will die unless the Lord comes. And are you ready to face death? Death. The most important question is the question of what you've done with your own soul. Have you given it to God? Now, in order to understand what's going to happen eternally, Jesus Christ, he has us to look at a final question. That's the question of our hearts. Notice there in verse 28, then one of the, one of his scribes, one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, 
the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no one, no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all, than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Now, Mark depicts this scribe as more genuine than the others who've come to question Jesus. Apparently, a scribe decides to step out from the crowd a bit, and he hears that Jesus answers wisely. So he has a question, and he's not asking for any ulterior motive. He just wants to know, what is the first commandment? Now, he doesn't mean chronologically. There were 613 commandments in the Torah. But he doesn't want to know which one comes first, but he wants to know which is the weightiest, which one is the greatest. And we've got all kinds of questions about greatest. Uh, who, who's the greatest basketball player? Who's the greatest quarterback come up recently? We have all these kinds of questions about who's the greatest, but he says, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus quotes through scriptures, but he really focuses and, and hones in there's two that are the greatest, and he really sees them almost as one. He almost joins Deuteronomy chapter 10 and Leviticus 19 here together. And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. In other words, he sings, you have to love God with every resource of your being. And Jesus is talking about paying the authorities. He's talking about preparing for the afterlife. But now he focuses on this prioritizing of your affection, your love for God. That really determines whether or not you are a true believer. We love God with every resource of our being. The heart that he speaks of here is the emotions. He's saying, do you love God with your emotions? Then he speaks about the soul, which is our spiritual life and self-consciousness. Then he talks about the mind, which is our thought life, our intellect. The strength refers to, I believe, all the ability or the power, even bodily, that we have. And what he's telling us is that we have to give ourselves completely to God. Now, a lot of people get this wrong. They think that their relationship with God is based upon their rituals. I come to church, I've been baptized, I, I, I vote for Christian values. They, they think it's about resolutions. I'm going to decide this year that I'm going to give up drinking or smoking or uh, give up uh, uh, whatever bad thing it may be. <laughs> there, there's some people that think it's about good deeds. I'm just going to try a little harder. I'm going to give a little more money. I'm going to uh, try to hand out a few more sack lunches. But he says it's not about resolutions. It's not about rituals. It's not about good deeds. It's about a relationship with God. Loving God from every aspect, every ounce, every fiber of your being. That's what it means to have a relationship with God. It's not just something that you can profess. It's something that you're going to practice. Now, don't get me wrong. You're not saved by works. But if you genuinely profess you will practice your feet will take you where your mouth has said it will go what he says is that here's this is a real practical way to see if you really love God with every source of your being because that's a vertical relationship but he says we're also going to have a horizontal relationship you're going to love your neighbor as yourself if you say you love God it will be evident in the way that you treat other people First John chapter 4 tells us that if we say we love God and despise or mistreat our brothers, sisters in Christ, that we're a liar. Sinclair Ferguson put it like this, God is never satisfied with anything less than the devotion of our whole life for the whole duration of our lives. I think that's very well said. We give him our whole life for the whole duration of our life. It's not just a one-time commitment. It's just not walking down an aisle, praying a prayer, and walking away like we never did anything. It's a com continual relationship that we have for God. And it's not, we don't have this relationship by laboring for God, but having a love for God. Notice after this, the Bible says that no one dared ask him any more questions. No one was going to ask Jesus because he had schooled them all. He had shown that he was the most brilliant of all teachers who've ever lived. And he has all the questions, the answers to all the questions that we have in life. 
Whether it's a personal issue or a political issue, he says, I've got the answer. Whether it's an earthly issue or an eternal issue, Jesus Christ has the answer. And our lives, the questions that we bring to God and the way that we respond to those means that they have to, our lives need to be informed by the gospel of Jesus. And where I want to leave you, leave you this morning is where Jesus left the scribe. He said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far from the kingdom of God. He was saying that you're spiritually near the kingdom of God, which is the rule of God in your life. You know, you've almost turned your life over to the rule of God. He says, you're close. But in that, in that statement, this implied that you've not come far enough. You've, you've gotten very close. You, you've got the right understanding there needs to be a commitment. So he had to go further and realize that the one who had brought the kingdom was standing there right in front of him. Now Jesus had taught that there is a resurrection. That there is life after death. But you can believe in the future resurrection. You can believe in the resurrection of Jesus. But until you understand that he is the resurrection and the life and that you've entrusted yourself into that relationship with him, you're still going to be outside the kingdom of heaven. You, you can have the right view of politics. You, you can vote the right way on the right issues and understand what's happening politically. But that doesn't mean you're a Christian. You, you can have the right doctrine, but be lost and without God. You can be able to recite Bible verses like this scribe, but you might be lost and on your way to hell. And just because you're in the church this morning doesn't mean you're in the kingdom. Can I say that one more time? Just because you're in the church this morning does not mean that you're in the kingdom of God. The question is, is how far are you from the kingdom this morning? I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. The good news is no matter how far away you are, you can come into the kingdom this morning. Here's the bad news, though. No matter how close you are, if you don't make a decision to move into the kingdom, you'll always be outside the kingdom. You, you can be right there at the one-yard line and fail to get in. I'm reminded of that story over in the book of Exodus about the bronze serpent. And Moses lifted that serpent up on a pole. And he said, whenever you're bit, look at it, and you'll be healed. There were probably some people there who were bit by, that, by those serpents, who were just inside the camp, maybe even just in the shadow of that serpent. And they had to look up, and they were healed. There were others who were way outside the camp, maybe out gathering firewood, and they were bit. And to them, it looked just like a, a, a faint silhouette on the horizon. But it didn't matter how close they were or how far away, they all had to do the same thing. They looked in faith. This morning, you may be close to God and close to the kingdom, or you may be very far away. You may be here every week, or this may be your first time. But as we stand together, and we're going to sing a hymn of invitation about the old rugged cross. I'm going to be standing right here at the front. And if you'd say, David, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want a relationship with him so that every area of my life will be informed by Christ. You come and say, David, I, I want to receive Jesus. Maybe you already know him and you trust him, but there's some priorities, some things in your life that have got out of alignment. And you just need to kneel in this altar. Maybe the Lord's calling you to make some other decision to unite with our church or follow him in ministry. You come as we sing and respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit in your heart.